This week in Phoenix, Arizona, an Iraqi man is suspected of running down his 20-year-old daughter because he thought she was becoming too westernized. Then this past Sunday, a man in Jordan was charged with murder after allegedly stabbing his 22-year-old daughter 25 times in the stomach with a sword because she was unmarried and pregnant. They're called honor killings supposedly to preserve the honor of a family. And these sorts of crimes are rampant. The United Nations estimates that 5,000 women are murdered this way each year. That's 13 a day. Worse, they're hard to prosecute. But people are trying. We're joined by award-winning journalist Rana Husseini. For 16 years, she's been working on this issue. She's become one of the leaders in a campaign to end the practice, and she is out with a new book, Murder in the Name of Honor, the true story of one woman's heroic fight against an unbelievable crime. Just last week, she was recognized as one of Utney Magazine's 50 visionaries changing the world. Well, let's hope you're changing it, Rana. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to Grit TV. Thanks. The title of the book is the title of the first story that you published on the subject. Talk about how you, well, it, you say that story changed your life. Yes, it was a really sad story of a 16-year-old schoolgirl who was killed by her family and her only mistake was being raped by one of her brothers. Basically, the family blamed her for the rape and she was a victim maybe five or six times because the brother tried to kill her, she became pregnant, underwent a secret abortion, and then she was married to a man 34 years older than her and then six months later he divorced her. And the day he divorced her, another brother killed her. So imagine, she's only 16, she went through all this horrific time and uh, horrific moments in her short life. And then when I went to talk to her uncles, they basically blamed her for the la rape. Mm -hmm. And sh they said she seduced her brother uh, to sleep with her. So to me, this was a shocking uh, experience, uh, one that I have never lived before. And uh, when I reported the story for the Jordan Times the following day, an in influential uh, woman called and she was screaming and yelling at my editors that they should stop me from reporting these crimes because it's not us or our society and that these things do not happen in Jordan. So I became even more enraged because the call came from a woman and uh, I just decided that I wanted to show her and show everyone else that no, this is us, this is our society, these things happen and we should not uh, bury our head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. And as your book reveals, it's not only in your society. Exactly. Now one of the most powerful parts of what you've done is talk to the killers, mm -hmm. talk to the men. Tell us about their story and what happens to them. Uh, I, I really th don't think that uh, anyone really wants to kill his uh, female relative that he grew up with most of his life and uh, grew up to love her. Uh, I think some of these killers are victims themselves and uh, I'm sure they live in a dilemma for the rest of their life because they are normal people and the society and the family changes them into killers. But aren't they told they're going to be heroes? They're going to be celebrated? This is what they have to do for the honor exactly. of Exactly. It's like they brainwash them. Uh, you know, they hold them responsible for the honor of the family if they don't kill their female relatives. And they say, if you don't kill, people will look down on us. We will be outcast. You have to do it. And sometimes they choose young men like under 18 uh, because the, the system there treats them as juveniles. And then at the age of, age of 18, they are released from a juvenile center. And Without the criminal records. Who, who chooses them? The family members. So what happens? There's like a family convention it's and they uh, decide <laughs> who's going to do what? Yeah, I mean, it's not a convention, but uh, <laughs> I think when they uh, decide that they want to do it, they, they sit like the elderly in the family and uh, decide. It's not always the case. Sometimes it's uh, spontaneous and sometimes it's premeditated. I mean, there, it's different uh, circumstances. So the, me the men, sometimes young, go to jail. What happens after they come out? Um, I mean, uh, the ones I met, uh, there was one actually I couldn't meet because he got so depressed uh, after he killed his sister. He didn't want to talk to anyone. Uh, another one said, oh, you know, I was treated as a hero in prison and uh, my family said uh, he will take care of you when you get out. But when he got out, nobody really uh, looked at him or cared or did the promises they said they will do. Does he ever get married? He said he wasn't finding it hard uh, to get married uh, because everyone is thinking that he might kill their daughter. So basically, it's a very tough situation. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think anyone would live uh, a happy uh, or normal life after taking someone's life in that manner, you know. It's powerful the way that you describe the whole family, the whole society, but the whole family's uh, reaction to what happens. But one of the most stark details is that the record of that woman's life is just expunged. 
you couldn't even find pictures. Exactly. That's why I wanted to write about these women and document their their cases to document that they lived on this earth and that someone robbed them from their life. At least uh, have uh, give them the the right to be recorded that they died. At the time I started, nobody was really reporting about these issues. It was taboo. The Arabic press shied away from reporting about it. And I felt that I'd, I had to document the cases. So you go to the family, you say, tell me about your daughter. What happened? Uh, sometimes they refuse to talk, and sometimes they do talk. And uh, one, the, my, the story that I told you, told you about, um, the family basically got rid of uh, all her pictures. And uh, I spoke to three of her sisters, and they had different opinions about what happened. One was sad that her sister got killed. The second was not sure, and the third blamed her. Uh, for being raped. And of course, she's repeating what she heard from the, the older uh, people in her family. So in in, rea in fact, families really do not want to talk to the press because when they kill, they want to kill to stop the rumors and stop the talking about this issue. So the last thing they want is for a reporter to come and report the case. How prevalent is this crime? Uh, well, in Jordan, we're talking about between 20 cases around uh, every year. Mm. Uh, in, other, in Pakistan, for example, it's over 2,000. Uh, in Turkey, it's a very high number also. Uh, in Yemen and Syria, we're talking about 200 cases every year to 300 cases. What happens to the women that survive? Because not all of them are killed. Uh, it depends. For example, in Jordan, some of the women who uh, survive, they lock them in prison uh, to protect them for their own safety in what is termed as protective custody. And I've been to prison and uh, I've met some women who've been there for uh, several years and they wasted their youth behind bars because someone wants to uh, harm them. So that's one th another thing that I, I focused on in my work uh, because I think that in any country in the world, uh, the killer or the, uh, sorry, the, the person who's threatening your life should go to prison and not the other way around. I'm with you on that. <laughs> now, let's talk about the means at your disposal to prosecute because I was fascinated by how hard it is to bring these cases in Jordan. Um, you, you're talking about the criminal prosecutor? Yeah. Well, and in the beginning, the criminal prosecutors did not pay much attention to these crimes because usually what happens is the, the, the defendant or the suspect uh, kills his sister and then goes and turns himself into police claiming to have cleansed his family's honor and hand... <laughs>